Hi, this is Colleen D'Arcy from Saginaw Valley, the Early Childhood Faculty. We are here today to talk with infant toddler service providers about their experiences in providing services to families with young children. I have with me several guests who have um, experience in the field, and I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Janet Topham, and I am the Project Find and Birth to Five Coordinator for Saginaw Public Schools. Hi, my name is Deetra Weston. I'm also known as Dee. I am an employee of Saginaw Public Schools. I am an infant toddler special education teacher. And I'm Debbie Lively, and I'm faculty out here at Saginaw Valley State University, but spent over 20 years working with families in the home and am a national trainer for a parent infant program called Sky High. Hi, I'm Sally Meyer. I'm recently retired from Saginaw Public Schools as a parent infant trainer and, and teacher. Hi, my name is Crystal Sharpa. I am currently a student obtaining my master's degree in early childhood education at Saginaw Valley State University, and I am an aspiring home visitor. Well, thank you, ladies, for joining us today. We appreciate that. I have questions that students have posed about your experiences as infant toddler teachers, and so I'm going to start with Janet, if that's okay. okay. Mm -hmm. The first question that we have is, how do parents find about how do, how do they find out about the services? Are they referred? Do they have to come to you? How do they get in touch? Um, parents are referred from many different sources. They can refer themselves. Um, they might find our number, our early on number, uh, or Project Find number online. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of pediatricians, uh, we get referrals from them. And other doctors, family doctors, um, sometimes just word of mouth. Another family might know about our services and we get referrals that way. So they come from a, a lot of different sources. Okay. Although it is a voluntary program, um, if you are a caregiver or a family member of someone who has a child between the ages of zero and three, who you feel may qualify for the early on program, you do have the ability to be able to make a referral. You can do it simply by going to the website 1800earlyon.org. Upon going to that website, you'll see a referral tab, and if you just click online, it will take you through the referral form and process. It will also ask for your contact information and your relation to the child. It is something that the early on program would take a look at and take into consideration the information that you have included to determine if an evaluation is something that they would go and move forward with, and if this child would qualify for an individual family support plan or an IFSP. But it is something that the families and parents would have to support and ultimately make the decision whether their child would be receiving services through the early on program. Okay. Are they generally voluntary or in some cases is it court mandated? Um, really all of our services are voluntary. They can um, be urged by the court if a family is involved with child protective services okay. um, or if the child is in place in foster care, they can be urged to um, call us and mm -hmm. get involved in our services. But when it comes right down to it, it's um, up to the parent and okay. whether they want to participate or not. How is the program funded? The program is funded through the IDEA um, grant special education, um, through our public schools. There's probably some general fund monies in there too, but every, every county in Michigan has their own project finder early on um, and, and their own way of doing things too, but the emphasis is on providing services to infants who are developmentally delayed in their home as a home-based service. Okay. So we know now how parents get in contact with you. Mm -hmm. How is it determined whether or not they're eligible for the services then? Well, then we go through kind of a lengthy evaluation process, and anyone can chime in here. Um, <laughs> when I first get a referral, I'm, I contact the family, and that has to be done in a timely manner. Um, we make a, a first contact within uh, 10 days. Usually it's not that long uh, by phone. 
And in my particular position at Saginaw Public Schools, we're unique in that we have three infant teachers on our staff. And so I will get the referral um, and then just probably call the parents sometimes and get some general information if I don't have a lot of information, if it came from the website or if it came from a doctor, mm -hmm. um, make a contact. And then I will um, just kind of give these referrals to one of our infant teachers, whoever's um, lucky number is up at that particular <laughs> time, <laughs> then they get the referral. And um, then they contact the parents, set up a home visit, and the evaluation process begins okay. um, uh, in home. Now, depending on what that child needs after we make that initial home visit, if they need uh, just an evaluation from the, like say the, the early childhood special education teacher and maybe um, an OT or a PT, they would be part of the team. We have to have at least two disciplines, two different disciplines when we do the evaluation. So a teacher just can't go in there and evaluate the child just by themselves. We have to have either the OT or PT, a medical person, mm -hmm. or the speech therapist. So mm -hmm. a lot of our kids who are maybe two to two and a half that we get referrals on, um, if there's no existing physical problems or you know anything that there's concerns about, then we usually have the speech person as our, our second part of our, our multidisciplinary team. Okay. So then we go the we go in the home. Um, the parents sign some uh, an authorization to share, um, consent to evaluate. That's probably the old term, but I still use that. Mm -hmm. um, and giving us permission to do the testing, okay. and then that starts. And we have thirty school days. And this is kind of a confusion right now. We're we're going to be merging the IEPs and the IFSPs into one paperwork. Mm -hmm. Um, for early on, but right now early on laws say we have to complete that evaluation within 45 calendar days and the special education rules say we have to complete that evaluation within 30 um, school days. So okay. they kind of turn out to be roughly the same, but you know, it's a mm -hmm. little confusing. In any event, about six weeks we have to get the evaluation done. Okay, okay. so within a six week time frame. Right. Time frame. right. I would just like to say one thing too, if, if a child dependent on their disability, um, different things are required. For example, if a child has a vision loss or hearing loss or physical disability, right. then it's absolutely pertinent to have the medical documentation um, as part of that IEP or IFSP. Although the physicians don't attend the meeting or don't regularly participate within right. the Right, they would the in some, anything yeah. physical. And actually, on the IFSP, we do have to send something to um, whoever that child's pediatrician or family mm -hmm. doctor is and get a statement, uh, at least of health, um, that mm -hmm. as part of the IFSP. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have a form that we send to the doctor's office, usually via um, fax, oh. and we ask for the information to be filled in according to the child, how often do you see this child in your office, um, what services do she receive, are the shots updated, mm -hmm. and what is the diagnosis, and um, any other information is asked for at the bottom of the form. And doctors are pretty good about returning that form. Okay. They've gotten better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We struggled for a lot of, a lot years, of years with getting yeah. there. Oh, yeah. and, and certain things are required based mm -hmm. on what the state requires mm -hmm. per right. eligibility category. For example, if a child has a hearing loss, then they have to have an audiological evaluation. Mm -hmm. They have to have um, documentation from an ENT otolaryngologist. Um, they have to have some educational documentation saying that it is educationally significant. The mm -hmm. disabilities need right. to demonstrate that. And, and that would be the team, which would be different then, with a child than, like a child with autism, for example, right. which would require maybe more individuals participating on that team. So the teams, these multidisciplinary teams, are dependent, the makeup is dependent on what one thinks that the child might need, the services that the child might need, and their disability category. Okay. And, and sometimes, that, oh, I'm sorry, Sally. Oh, I was just going to say that when... Um, a teacher goes in, they talk to the family, and they ask the family what their concerns are. Um, and at that point, you can kind of get an idea of what they think the delays are and what are the areas. Like if they say something like, I, I don't think she's seeing, mm -hmm. the, I don't think she's seeing, or he, he, never, he never turns when the telephone rings, then that gives us a hint. Or mm -hmm. obviously, we get on the floor and we play with the child. 
uh, and uh, watch what they do with their hands and, and if they can walk. And, and so then we go back to our office and we say, I think I need a uh, visually impaired teacher consultant or I need um, somebody to look at the ear situation or I need a physical therapist or an occupational therapist. Then we start pulling the team together. Right. Okay. Um, once kind of we get back, you have to first. scope it out first, mm -hmm. because you we need to develop a relationship with this right. family, so that first things first is that we want them to know we're listening to their concerns. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. want them to know that um, they they are a member of our team, right. and we need them to give us freely their concerns. Mm -hmm. So that, that um, yes. is kind of our first, because if you don't have that relationship, mm -hmm. then um, it's kind of like pulling teeth. Sally brings up a lot of important things to consider. And I fully support a lot of the statements that she has said. The most important being the relationship piece. It's crucial that we get to know our families, the parents, the caregivers, um, the support system that surrounds that child, whether it's the grandparents or a daycare provider, even siblings, um, not just the child specifically, but building a relationship with everyone and all individuals. It's through that relationship that we can build trust and good rapport with the parents and family, and that's the manner in which you can get them to buy into things. It's important that we reassure them and let them know that we really care about them and their child, um, the situations and things that they may be struggling with. And so the most important thing for us to do in building that relationship is to ask those open-ended questions and to be an active listener. Going in the first time, I might not recommend going in, doing an evaluation right off the bat. Go in, sit down, don't bring anything except for yourself, and just ask questions. Ask them what they're seeing, what they're recognizing with their child. Ask them about themselves, their home, the things that they enjoy, their interests. Ask them about things that they like to do together as a family. And collect all this information to be able to use to not only build that relationship with the family, but also to take into consideration later on when working with the family and the child. And it's definitely important that we build that relationship. And I can't emphasize that enough. Relationship first. You really have to establish that trust right, right. off, even from the first phone call, you know. Right. Um, even when I make a contact and I may not necessarily be involved in that particular mm -hmm. evaluation um, but it's really important mm -hmm. if you're going to you know take that family through those steps of evaluation to have them buy into that whole mm -hmm. idea of evaluating their child and coming to their home that's um, true the relationship is key and if you establish a good relationship up front with the family chances are you're going to have a good relationship throughout the whole process of the home visits. Mm -hmm. And um, the parents usually are on target when they say that what the concerns are that they have for their child. And most times, most often, they are on target. Yeah, in some yeah. way, it's really, even right. when a doctor, you know, you'll get a referral, say, maybe, the, I mean, the doctor won't say it, or wherever you get it from, they, they might say, well, you know, parent is concerned about this or that, but, you know, we didn't really observe that here or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. In, in some respect, and the parent may not be able to articulate that or, or really explain what that is, but it's something that they have a feeling of in the back of their mind because they know their child the best, mm -hmm. that, that's mm -hmm. a concern that's usually real. Mm -hmm. And the federal guidelines specifically state that the parent is part of the IFSP mm -hmm. or right. IEP. They are a team member. Yeah, they are a team member. And so what we always need to remember is that they need to be informed all along the process. That helps build that trust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not going to do anything behind the table or behind the scenes. Everything is up front and out there because that parent is a member of that team. You make a great point, Deb, in stating that it is the law that parents are involved. But even if it weren't the law, I think I would highly recommend 
that a parent definitely be on the team for their child because nobody knows their child better. Nobody has spent more time with the child than the parents. And the parents have been that child's first teacher. And letting them know that would help build their confidence that they can do it. They've been doing it all along. And that we're simply there to support them as the teacher. And that, and um, they mentioned the consent to evaluate, and it's very important on the consent to evaluate that you say to the parent, I may be calling in a therapist, and so if you want the therapist, then initial this, or mm -hmm. I may want to be, I will be con contacting your doctor, do I have your permission to contact mm -hmm. the pediatrician? Correct. So the parents know we're not, as Debbie said, not going behind the scenes, they know we explain this all, mm -hmm. you know, the health mm -hmm. angle, the mental health angle, the psychologist, uh, the therapist, so that they know, and they we're coming to the home, so they have to buy into it, as, as Dee said. They really drive, the parents are driving the evaluation as far as, mm -hmm. you know, how much they're included and who they want to have included. Mm -hmm. you know, and if that. the parents are driving it, and you mentioned the need for consent as well, and, and it definitely sounds like the initial uh, um, coming together is very intricate. A lot of a relationship, needing to establish trust, also getting information. Um, what happens when a parent refuses services? Have you ever had that happen? Yes. I, I yes. had um, a lovely family who allowed me to come in a couple of times. And then you could start to see the panic building in their, their faces as to maybe we weren't going to say it was just a speech delay, maybe there mm -hmm. was something else. And um, the worst case mm -hmm. I had, they just stopped answering the phone, they didn't come to the door, mm -hmm. um, all of the extra mm -hmm. numbers of the grandmas, all of a sudden nobody answered, they were screening their calls, and um, it was it was a very unfortunate situation. And um, But it has to be their choice. This is a voluntary program. And it has to be their choice. We can we can try and sell ourselves mm -hmm. the best we can, but right. sometimes mm -hmm. we just uh, we just have to let it go and say a prayer. Mm -hmm. Several yes. of our students hit. I'm sorry. Oh, I was going to say. Unfortunately, our parents often will not just come right out and say they don't want our services. Mm. Oftentimes, you they'll know, it's a process. They'll go along with you for a while. Yeah, they'll like, go along well, he for, a for a while. And then, yes, and uh, I see. and then they'll start not answering the phone, not returning calls and okay. not answering the door type things what Sally just mentioned but it's always indirect it's never direct head-on mm -mm. that they let us know that they don't I, want I actually service. went to a home visit one time and I'm knocking on the door and I hear this little voice inside saying mama says we're not home oh. <laughs> <laughs> and no I didn't get in <laughs> but, but I think what's really important is that when you have a family that is looking that they, they don't want services and they're doing it indirectly or however, it's, it's really important that we as parent advisors that we convey that message and that we say, you know, when you're ready or- Leave the you, door open. If, yeah, yeah, leave, leave the, the door, door open. open cause, okay. Because part of having a child with a disability is the loss of that dream, mm -hmm. that child right. that you exactly. were thinking about when you were mm -hmm. pregnant. And then when you have this baby and it has a disability and you have to deal with that, it, sometimes grief just kind of shuts the door for a while. Right. And so we just have to remember, it's not, okay, I'm a bad person, mm -hmm. I'm not really good at what I'm doing. It's maybe at that point in that person's life, they're just not ready for the services mm -hmm. and we have to be open-minded and just leave the door open for them. I think the hardest part of being a home visitor would be going into a home and having the best of intentions and wanting to help that child and that family and experiencing the grief with them that they may be feeling and not taking it personally when they're not there and ready to receive the services through early on would be very difficult. I think that we need to take into consideration, as Deb said, that they're just not ready. They're, they're not there yet. It's not because they're a bad parent. It's not because they don't want what's best for their child. It's just because they're not ready. And when they are ready, please 
contact us. Let us know we're always there. Our job is to support the families in whatever manner that may look. And sometimes the support needs to happen from afar as we just think of them and wait in anticipation for them to come to us and say, I'm ready now. What can you do to help us move forward? Well, and that leads to one of the questions that the students posed too, which was that, you know, Dr. Brazelton writes about three different defensive behaviors that a parent might exhibit after identifying that their child may have some type of a disability. Um, these behaviors include denial, proje uh, projection, and detachment. So how do you best support a parent who may be dealing with these? I think with families, when, when, they're, when they are grieving for this child that they lost, I think that we just have to be there supporting them where their child mm -hmm. is. It's not like saying, oh, well, it's going to get better. You know, oh, I've got great services here, and these services are going to make things all better. Because you, you, they're not ready for that. You need to just listen to what they have to say and be patient mm -hmm. with families mm -hmm. and understand that those are healthy parts of grieving, that it's important Correct. for parents to be able to mm -hmm. um, deny. I mean, that's healthy, healthy yeah. grieving. I had a family once that, you know, they just couldn't come to terms with the child having this particular disability. And yet I had another family that they just jumped in and you thought like, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, you haven't allowed yourself to like grieve at all. You're like going way, I mean, they were gonna do whatever they could and this was a child with a severe disability. Um, but you know what, we all do it Everybody's, differently. Everybody and men different. and women mm -hmm. do it differently and mm -hmm. you know, siblings in the mm -hmm. family, they also grieve and, and cultures so do it differently. cultures do it differently yes. and so we just we just need to listen and just be supportive rather than trying to deny it ourselves mm -hmm. and make them move through the process. You, you know, you can't make a person do something if they're just not ready. The emotions that Colleen mentioned are very normal um, emotions for any individual to experience. And being an adult, I know I've experienced them myself in different situations and circumstances. And I can't help but feel that how I would like someone to deal with it for me is how I should best deal with it for the parents. Don't go in with a one size fits all mentality. Don't go in trying to fix it for the parents. Go in to simply listen and support them and be a part of the grieving process for them and join them in the journey that they will go through as they experience the different emotions that they may be in denial one day and angry another day and then accepting another day and, and then angry another day. It's Grieving is a process, but it's not just a process that goes from one step to another to another. It's important to understand also that there will be bad days. There will be times when they'll get to one step and then they'll go to a different step again. And our job is just to be there for them to support them. Don't come in with a bag of goodies and, and try to fix every problem for them and let them know that, again, we care, we are there, and ask them, what can we do to help and support you? And as Debbie said, the listening is so important and in the process of listening, if we, we really are careful, we can catch that one little thing that they'll say that's positive. Mm -hmm. And if we grab mm -hmm. on to that one little positive thing and say, oh my goodness, that just sends chills down my spine because look at what your little baby's doing. Mm -hmm. And build in build tiny pieces sometimes mm -hmm. that positive 
um, those little bitty steps and we keep trying to say to them don't compare to other children don't mm -hmm. compare to your other children the neighborhood children the children at church just we're going your child is going to advance it's going to be at a different rate mm -hmm. than maybe those other children but your child will advance and we are going to be their best cheerleaders and mm -hmm. we are going to be there and we are going to watch this happen and celebrate your child mm -hmm. so we we kind of switch it from understanding the negative but believing that the positive is there too. Being a kindergarten teacher at this point in time and working in the public schools, I can't help but get excited about what Sally is saying, how each child is their own individual, will make their own progress. And we can't compare each child because every child is unique. Every family situation is different. And it makes me so excited because I find many times in the school systems, we are looking to create that one size fits all model and treat, creating children and treating them all the same, looking for the same outcome. And being in the data-driven world that we are in right now, we are doing nothing except for comparing children to children. And how exciting that being a parent advocate, you are allowed to take the opportunity to work with each child as an individual, create specific individual goals for that child, and to be able to watch them grow and learn and blossom into their own person without comparing them to other children or having certain expectations that are mandated to be met. So it really sounds that in addition to having the child as a focus, and the needs that that child exhibits, oh boy. it's also support for the family itself absolutely. and supporting oh, that attachment. It's very yes, much a, a parent and family support. And, and in fact, our approach. job if it, it was defined as parent, infant, advisor. In fact, we are supposed to be teaching the parents. Mm -hmm. We Our job is to go in, because we can't go in in an hour or two a week and, and make that much of a difference with a baby or a toddler. Mm -hmm. The parents are the ones. They're there 24-7, or the caregivers are there 24-7. So we're going to help them with ideas. If they're not stacking blocks, let's pull the, the sofa pillows off and let's start stacking pillows or get the cereal boxes out and let's start playing with that. Things around the house, but showing the parents and the caregivers all these wonderful ideas of things they can do. And we actually write out a little challenge at the end of each mm -hmm. visit with ideas that we, uh, things mm -hmm. that in our testing we have decided they need some help with, mm -hmm. but then we show parents different ideas of how they can play with that. And we actually revisit that when we go back in. Right. How did it go? Did you get around to stacking the sofa mm -hmm. pillows? Mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing. And, and so they, they can report and it's a give and take and, okay, that didn't work, but maybe the next idea will work. And mm -hmm. they're not all going to work. Well, Sally, you really hit on a lot of the points that as a student in the early childhood infant and program, infant and toddler program, I learned a significant amount about. Going into the program, I was not aware that the family would be as involved as they were. But certainly that should have been a hint to me that it's not called an IEP, but called an IFSP. Having the word family in there should be a big hint to me that it was going to involve the family. But even though it does involve the family, I was very unaware of the fact that the family was going to be so involved in the entire process. And how exciting to be able to have the opportunity to work with the parents, to find out what they have, what they know, because we've learned that children learn best in the natural setting. We have learned that students will do best with their teacher. So why does it not make sense 
that students would do best or children would do best with their parents. What an ideal situation to go into the home. The only programs that I'm familiar with are center-based programs or individualized programs where people would drop their child off and work with an occupational therapist or um, work with a physical therapist or the speech pathologist or go and work with a counselor outside of the home. And that was a big misconception that was cleared up for me as I continued to learn more about the early on services. And again, how exciting to be in the natural setting, to be able to learn through activities that are embedded into the everyday life using materials that the parents have access to. It is so less intimidating. It seems more natural, less scary, and easier to get parents to be able to buy into the idea of the early on services. And the parents come up with ideas too. They, and yes, boy, they, they mm -hmm. once, mm -hmm. once they kind of, you know, buy into that, they'll come up with ideas of things that, well, you know, maybe your idea didn't, idea didn't work, but mm -hmm. the parents' idea mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so then they start to become more involved. And it's really important when you do provide services in the home that when you decide upon activities or goals that you want to do on a weekly basis, that there is follow-up. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't follow up, with what we've asked families to do, then it's mm -hmm. like that accountability piece is yeah. totally gone, mm -hmm. and the parents think, well, they don't care. They don't care. I'm not going to. So that's part of building that mm -hmm. trust and that, you know, mm -hmm. really as a parent advisor, being consistent, going to the home on a regular basis, being on time. But again, that's hard because when you have a lot of home visits, sometimes. You know, you have to give yourself a window. That, like your time might be from two to two fifteen, because you have to allow for something that may have happened with the family before. Um, but the idea of being consistent, the idea of following up on what you agree upon with the family of what will be the follow up or the challenges for that week, um, that's so important. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in developing that trust. Mm -hmm. I think it's also important to note. That, as you stated, Deb, it's very important that we take the opportunity to follow up, as that is a very important part of the process. We get and receive recommendations. We complete evaluations and do screenings. From there, an IFSP is created, which includes goals that we set for the children. It is through those weekly visits that we have the opportunity to be able to teach the parents how to meet those specific goals. And if those goals are not met within a certain time frame, that those goals are adjusted accordingly. But if those goals are met, going into the home is the opportunity that we have to be able to reassess the student or do some progress monitoring to see the progress that the child has made so we may once again go through the process of recreating goals, teaching how to meet those goals, then reassessing the child again to determine if new goals need to be recreated or if we need to adjust the goal to make it more obtainable. It sounds like, you know, hearing, hearing you describe your experiences that you offer the services in the home. And Janet, uh -huh. you had mentioned yes. that, you know, many districts approach this in different ways. And there are districts still in Michigan mm -hmm. that choose to use center-based services right. for right. the infant toddler program. Can you describe some of the reasons why Sag well, Saginaw has chosen to go with, into the home? Um, I'm not familiar with services in Saginaw, nor have I ever received services or worked for that establishment. However, I'd like to speak on behalf of Saginaw Clearly the reason that Saginaw has chosen to go with the home model is because they recognize that it's their job and responsibility to do what is best for the child. It is research-based, but even more effective than research-based, it is evidence-based and best practice. Um, well, we just, I mean, we bought into this years and years ago that we feel that the, um, the parent knows the child best and the child is going to respond most consistently 
um, in their natural environment in their home or or daycare situation. And as I mean, as we've gone on, you know, I've been in this a lot of years. We have we do visit more daycares now than we probably did when Debbie and I first started doing it, and, and just because of, you know the workforce has changed and and you know so forth. But um, the research says that children do learn best at home and in, mm -hmm. and where they're most comfortable when they're young mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Now there are um, there are different districts that do you know do center-based programs and I think that's mostly a monetary you know monetary mm -hmm. reasons that that they do that. Um, we do it on a very small scale that we may have a child who's two and a half um, if they just need speech services and mm -hmm. um, we're you know speech therapists if anyone wants to become a speech therapist <laughs> you'll have a job till you die um, because we can't even find enough but um, if a child is two and a half plus and just qualifies for, for speech and language services we will often have the child start coming into our speech therapist on a weekly basis um, as a transition over to um, preschool and because our speech therapist uses a schedule, she, she uses a visual schedule that will, and the child, they have a locker and everything. So it's, um, it's a good transition from uh, home-based services and then preparing for preschool where you're gonna be a little more independent. And that's parent-child, the, the parent is right in mm -hmm. with the child, but mm -hmm. that's just a little different approach as far as you know, not going into the home all the mm -hmm. time, but that's for two and a half plus. So. Right, and when when a child, the big reason why Saginaw went to home-based intervention is because it's the law. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. is the law. And, in and, the natural environment, and, you're supposed to provide that. In 1972, there was research done on home intervention versus center-based intervention, and it was clearly evident that the home-based intervention um, produced better results, particularly in the area of language development. And um, you know, it, it's hard for me to understand why some areas would still be doing, even if it is from a fiscal um, a reason, mm -hmm. um, I, I don't understand it because what's really important is that we deliver services to family that are appropriate and that show the most progress. And it's so it's hard for me to understand how we can still yeah. have pockets of like that still existing. The idea of transitioning a child, a child that's two and a half plus, they are eligible for school-based program at mm -hmm. age three. And so that is, and, and we're required by law to have a transition plan in place. So that makes perfect sense. But when you have like a one-year-old who might have cerebral palsy and um, yeah, you're coming. making the parents bring them out when they're already going to doctors and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And plus our goal is, you know, we're there for the sprint. The parents are there for the for marathon. The, for the long mm -hmm. right. And, you know, we need to help give them skills and not just skills, in helping to meet the needs of their child that has this disability, but we also need to help them have advocacy skills. I mean, parents need to advocate for appropriate services. And to and, know what those are. And, and to know what those are. Job mm -hmm. to educate. There's the Dr. Lively that I have learned to love and appreciate and have learned so much from. My favorite statement was when you mentioned that you just don't understand why the center model continues, even if it has to do with fiscal reasons. It is not okay to not do what is best for a child, period. And empower parents yes. mm -hmm. to be their child's advocate, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. especially a child who's, who has a lot of um, a lot of delays and is maybe involved physically, um, parents are going to have to be their advocate mm -hmm. down the road. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I don't know any parent who has a child who has a lot of involvement that hasn't had to do that in some way, thinking ahead to, you know, to um, two kids that we've had and who are grown now. I, I, at some point, even though the law provides in, in school, you know, for providing for, for children, um, that have delays, it's still, as a parent, you, mm -hmm. you really have to make sure you are advocating mm -hmm. and make sure they're getting what they, what mm -hmm. they need mm -hmm. and what's appropriate for them. My next question is going to be given to each of you as, as a thought about um, a home visit that you have been on, because uh, now that we're talking about home visiting mm -hmm. versus a center base, where you think it really um, demonstrates 
the importance of being in the home versus having the parents be in the center. That maybe you would, maybe there was something accomplished that you don't know that would have been accomplished had the child been in a center-based program at that same time. So, I just if any of you have an example. Well, of that. I can give you one. I, uh, my background is um, POHI, which is physically and otherwise health impaired. So, I, I, obviously, I, I do all areas of development. But I had one child who, who just we were trying to get that child to pull up, mm -hmm. just pull to stand. And the mom was actually taking the child extra to the hospital physical therapy department. Okay. And they were working so hard on trying to get that child to pull up on, a, on, on the little therapy table. And what we did was we took the cushions mm -hmm. off the couch and put some toys right there. Now, you know, the difference in the height was so much better and the toys were right there. And that child pulled to stand because, first of all, he was comfortable in his own mm -hmm. home. They were his toys. Mm -hmm. It was his couch. Everything smelled like mom and dad and sister and brother. Mm -hmm. And it was such a it was such an eye opener for me because I had gone to the therapy session just mm -hmm. so that I could meet the therapist too and watch them try. Mm -hmm. And then we did it at home, and it was like. Mm -hmm. And it was very exciting. So that's my one a of very my many, clear illustration. Very clear mm -hmm. illustration of the difference. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can recall um, a student that I had, and probably just recently, that um, was in the mode of being potty trained, uh -huh. and with him being a drug exposed child, mm -hmm. that um, was tactile, defensive, and just afraid of um, new and surroundings. Even mm -hmm. though he was coming to the community play groups, mm -hmm. um, he just didn't want to use the potty in the play group setting, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so it was. A good opportunity while I was in the home playing with him myself and the occupational therapist because of the tactile defensiveness he was being slowly made to adapt to different mm -hmm. kinds of touches um, he was able to show us that he could go to the potty mm -hmm. in his own environment as opposed to being in the community playgroup setting mm -hmm. and so that was nice to be able to see and he hadn't got to the point yet where he was verbalizing that he needed to use the potty but just that he was able to go on schedule uh -huh. and so mom would suggest that it, did he need to go potty and yes he did and so she was able to demonstrate that yes you know he is beginning to go potty number one of course <laughs> although not a home visitor and never have experience actually visiting in a home i can imagine that it is best for the child to learn in the natural setting because that's where the child will feel most comfortable and make the most progress. A specific example that I can think of is if you were looking to do some kind of activity at home that involves, for example, being outside in the backyard or a behavior thing that you may be working on with the child and trying to teach them how to remove themselves from the situation and perhaps find a calming place to go. What better way to demonstrate that than to actually look through the house and do that? Um, we learned about play corners and creating those for parents and how beneficial and powerful would it be to actually be with the parent in the home to say to them, this would be a wonderful location for you to be able to play with your child. And let me demonstrate to you how you can do that. And let's find some materials around your home right now while we're here that we can utilize. If we're in a center, I can only guess. I can only assume. And that's one reason why I wonder a lot about the time that we're in right now with the pandemic. How are we able to do the most effective job possible when not actually in the home? I understand we have cameras, we have videos, uh, we can have parents walk us around and show us things and how awesome that we have the technology available to be able to use that now, to be able to help our parents. I also feel that through video, it would be amazing to be able to model, possibly record, so that way the parents could go back and watch the recording to refer to again, um, because there's always something that you can get after watching something a second time that you may not have caught the first time. 
But I would be interested in knowing the effectiveness of utilizing cameras and videos versus actually being in the home setting. <laughs> you have to start <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> so it sounds like home-based services benefit not only the, the therapy itself and mm -hmm. the intervention that mm -hmm. you're doing, but also your ability to assess. Mm -hmm. Because yes. if you hadn't been in the home, you wouldn't have been able to see that he had already mm -hmm. achieved that. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, mm -hmm. Very interesting. Um, another set of questions we have about transition and thinking about when students begin to leave the program. Mm -hmm. What services do you generally um, make available to them? How do they, how do they recommend okay. it? Well, for transitioning students, we usually start um, three months, between three and nine months before their third birthday, and we start with the conversation. And then we also put it on paper. We have a transition form that we have to follow and go by, and we introduce that to the parent and explain to them that at three years old, the homebound services will stop, and then we can look at other alternatives, other options that are in the community. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, you know, that list can be a few or it can be you know more options because mm -hmm. there are the options of Head Start there's the option of the speech therapist that we offer at Project mm -hmm. Fine and there's also the option if the child is ECDD there's that option of a classroom setting for a three-year-old mm -hmm. there's also the option of the Millet Learning Center so there's lots of options and even a private daycare if mm -hmm. the family so chooses and um, we give the family all those options and then we sit and discuss as a team mm -hmm. what would be the best choice for their child. Mm -hmm. And um, they seem to like that idea and we even offered the strategy of let's go visit a couple mm -hmm. of these places that you think would be appropriate for your child. Mm -hmm. And they just love that opportunity to be able to make that visit together with the teacher mm -hmm. as opposed to venturing out alone That's to um, make that decision. I love that as the parent visitor and um, the one that has been working with the child since possibly birth, that we're the ones that are involved in the transition process because we have learned to get to know the family and the child. We're familiar with the goals that the child has achieved and the goals that the child has yet to achieve. And how amazing that we get to be a part of that process and that the process starts three to nine months before they turn um, the age of three. I would probably recommend more than nine months than the three month. So that way you have the opportunity to answer as many questions as possible, to be able to help reassure the parents, to take the time as was suggested, to go and visit some possible places, um, to provide the parents with some additional resources. I know that many times parents will come up with questions that they hadn't considered prior to, and so why not give them that nice window? Something I had never thought of before is actually taking the opportunity to go with the parent to a potential location that they would be considering for their child. Having been with the parents and the family, we've established that trust, and that trust will play a huge factor as trying to help the parents transition into the next steps for their child as they will turn to us many times and say, um, what, do you, what are your thoughts? What did you see that what would be great and beneficial for my child? Because although the parents know their child best, they are looking at it from a different perspective then we may be looking at it as teachers and educators. And so it's important that the parents have as much information as possible and how great for us to be able to have the opportunity to go somewhere and be able to provide the parents with the information that they need to be able to make the best decision for their child. And in addition to that, that we, we've made up a little checklist of things. We went to the teachers the mm -hmm. receiving teachers and said, if you had your wish list, what would you like this child to come having? Mm -hmm. And so we go over this list with the parent because it makes them aware of things that maybe they could be working on, like sitting at the table when they're eating instead of running around the room. Uh -huh. um, 
for example, can they get their own coat on and off? Do they mm -hmm. know what their backpack would look like? Uh -huh. Can they recognize maybe even one letter of their name so that if there was a B for Brandon, then that would be where he would, he, you know, and that's B in my, right there, it must be mine. And so we give them this list and it's very eye-opening. And one of the things that we do talk about is a regular schedule, bedtime, at a regular hour, because you know, if they're in a morning class, they you might have to get up early. early, so this, this, you know, because lots of times these babies stay up with their parents and then sleep in until 11 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And well, that can't happen if they're going to go to school in the morning. So we start that, that kind of that cognition of, oh, okay, this is school too. Mm -hmm. What's that bedtime routine right. like? What's that breakfast routine like? What's your nighttime routine like? They need to know that there should be a routine established at some point prior to that age three where they will start in another program. And it's amazing how that checklist, you are able to pull that out at later times within that window of turning three to say, okay, let's visit this again. How is Johnny doing on his mm -hmm. bedtime routine? How is he doing with his breakfast routine? And that's mm -hmm. something that you have that you can work with with the family and they're proud to know that their child has more yes marks than mm -hmm. they do no mm -hmm. marks mm -hmm. and so yeah. it's just an awesome tool. I am a huge supporter of routines and consistency. Both those things have proven to help children, um, even just people in general, to have the predictability of what is going to happen helps to eliminate anxiety for the children. So establishing those morning routines, those afternoon routines, um, they will have school routines that they will go through and having those evening routines. Um, what a great opportunity to ask the parents what kind of routines that they would like to incorporate what kind of routines they would like to see established. Perhaps they need um, a nice routine for dinner time, a dinner time routine, or a come home from school routine. Um, some things that we may not have even considered or that the parents may not have considered. I am also a huge advocate of utilization of visuals to go along with those routines, possibly a visual schedule. Again, helps eliminate anxiety for the child, gets them into the idea of routine, can incorporate the child in the process as well. Um, visuals make children very comfortable as they can't read the pictures. Um, perhaps taking some nonfiction pictures of some things, uh, taking a picture of you reading a book might be part of the nighttime routine and you can include that so that way the child knows that that is something that is going to take place for the nighttime routine. Or if you know that you want your child to use a spoon at dinner time, giving them that visual that, oh, tonight's dinner is you're going to use a spoon and not our fork today. Um, and it just makes it more comfortable for the child and makes it easy for them to be able to make some of these changes because change is scary for any individual. Another thing with transitioning um, that has been done in the past, too, is where if the child is going to go to a school-based program, that school-based teacher makes a visit to the home, right. mm -hmm. takes a picture, mm -hmm. you know, and leaves her picture with the child and the family and so that they can, you know, talk about it, yeah, right. talk about it and that they're going to participate. When I had an example of a transition, I worked with a family that had twins, and um, they were two different twins as far as their abilities. One had severe physical issues and the other one had some minor, but not, not so much. And, um, you know, everything we were, was worried about, like how the one child needed to go to more of a restrictive environment and mm -hmm. the one more to an inclusive environment. You know, and separating twins is very difficult for a family. Mm -hmm. But it was the parent after the visitation to the different programs saying, oh, no, sh there's no way that my child can go Parents, to this Parents, no. Once program, they visit, you think, oh, and, my gosh, they're going to want to yeah. go to this one. And then they'll say, no, no, I can see they're not going to fit into this one. So and my the worry that I carried as the parent advisor was, is, how am I going to convince this parent? Parent, you know, I didn't have to convince the parent the because parent, it just yeah. became a natural as part of a mm -hmm. really healthy, positive transition mm -hmm. plan. So um, mm -hmm. sometimes we worry about things that don't ever materialize. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Trying to anticipate what those may be. And we worry because we care. And we care because that family has become our family. That child has become our child. And we've built that relationship. And so we worry because we want what is best for that child and that family. As I was listening and I was hearing about the transition process taking place and the suggestion of having the new teacher send home uh, a picture of themselves was something that I had not thought of before. But I wonder if at that point, the teacher becomes a member of the, the team and hopefully becomes involved in the transition process and becomes involved in all the paperwork and the setting of goals and starting to build that relationship that we recognize as early childhood caregivers especially is so crucial. It sounds like the transition conversation begins long in advance before the actual transition occurs and also includes any agency or teacher that may be the recipient of the child as well to kind of bridge that. So you figure out how you're going to transition the child. How about transitioning the family? I imagine through all of these experiences, you really uh, bond, Mm -hmm. mentioned trust. Mm -hmm. How do you handle separating them? Especially if you get them at a very early age. I I have a thing that I learned. Um, I'll never forget I was at an IEP because what became the big IEP because the child was going to a school-based program. And I kept a notebook on every single child the family that I went to because I had so much information in it. But anyway, I had this child's notebook at the IEP, and it was just I was transferring the notebook to the new teacher Mm -hmm. because she would need this information. And we walked out of the building, the mom and I walked out of the building, and the mother burst into tears. (laughs) And I mean, just sobbed. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, so like, are, are you like worried, not happy with this? What's going on? She said, no, you gave your notebook away. <laughs> and I, I, that was just slapped me in the face. And I thought just the gesture of giving the notebook, which I thought was being very helpful. Mm-hmm. The parent, it was like I was she didn't leaving want to see her. That. Uh-huh. I yeah. was leaving her. And so she was for some abandoned. children, you have to transition out. And with some of the families that I worked with, I would see them a little bit when they went to school mm-hmm. initially uh-huh. to help with that transition because... It's very hard for families. It's you become part of that family system, and they share some of their most important mm-hmm. secrets with mm-hmm. you. And so, it really is very difficult mm-hmm. to leave families. You had shared the story with us once in class concerning the transferring of the notebook, and I thought that that was a great idea to utilize as documentation to have a notebook for each individual child. Um, When I used to go and see one of my doctors, I know one of my doctors used to have a little recorder, and then after he met, he would record himself. And I wonder if that might be a tool that could also be utilized in home visits. Um, After the visit, recording yourself with some of the notes that you have. Um, I know sometimes when I am doing things such as watching this video, I would talk to my phone and tell my phone to take notes so that way I could refer to it later on. And so technology has really allowed us to be able to do some things that I may not have thought of before, but documentation would certainly be important to have um, and just a thought and another form that it could happen. I would imagine not giving up the child, but passing the child on to a new, basically, parent advisor, um, being the teacher and the, the educator program and the um, and the individuals with whom they'll work would be the single hardest part of the job. The idea of being a part of a family and then letting them move on and having them establish new relationships. And I think of the idea of my own individual children. And as my children grow older, it's hard to let them go. It's difficult to Let them become their own people. And we know we're going to see them again. We know 
um, that we will hear about the fabulous things that they do, but just so hard. And I would think that that would be the hardest part for me. And I am very much a feeling person. And I feel feelings very strongly. So to not cry with the parent or to show my emotions would be very difficult. And I think that would be an important part of the process as well, as my mood and my emotions can be contagious. And I want them to recognize that it is a joyful time. It is a celebratory time, recognizing that the child has learned as much as they can and the parents have learned as much as they can from me and it's it's like they've graduated and and moved on to the next stages and as a parent that is a great feeling and so to be able to look at that as a celebratory moment with that family is certainly something that I feel a home visitor needs to do as well I think it's easier when the child is turning three more towards the spring. Right, and right. then you can see them over the summer, summer a little bit and kind of separate, mm -hmm. make that separation. But when they're going to turn three, like in December or January, and they can go in, they couldn't go to Head Start, but they could go into our um, ECSE, you know, mm -hmm. classroom. Man, that's like, yeah, that's like mm -hmm. you're just cut off right there. <laughs> well, and to be honest with you, even though I've recently retired, I am still very good friends with many of my mm -hmm. families. We're Facebook buddies, <laughs> and I get phone calls. I meet some. I meet this one mom for coffee at McDonald's. Mm -hmm. I, Debbie's right. We are family members, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. just because they they are three doesn't mean mm -hmm. that I don't want to know what they're doing when they're five or six mm -hmm. or seven if they want me. And mm -hmm. many of them do, and it's a lovely, it's a lovely honor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is. Just when you think about uh, time, I have um, students that I had a, an infant, and in, in fact, one particular um, a student at Central, and um, you know, she emailed me and wanted to friend me on Facebook, and it's mm -hmm. just the wildest mm -hmm. thing, you know, that you had a part in this child when they were like an infant, and this particular child I had as an infant, and then they grow up and they go to college, some of them, and they do wonderful things, and it's it's really kind mm -hmm. of nice to hear all those things too. I mean, because and makes you feel a little old too. Yeah, <laughs> in our case, <laughs> in our case, you're right. Yeah, that's not a good thing. It's the the bond that you build with the families probably helps you in numerous ways, and when just helping the family cope and and, and uh, celebrate the things mm -hmm. that are happening in the family as well. But I'm sure it also helps you assess what's actually being done within mm -hmm. the family um, with, as it pertains to the child. How can you tell if parents are using the strategies? And with that, how do you use parents' suggestions as you build those? So well, kind of two I, questions. But. I think, first of all, if you ask the parent, how'd you do with the stacking of this or whatever, and they, don't, they won't look in the eye, or they change the subject, or they suddenly have to change a diaper, you kind of get the feeling. So you think, okay, that wasn't a comfortable area for them. So we need to maybe um, change it around. And what would you think would be a good way to mm -hmm. do this, to encourage them and let them know that their opinion matters? Mm -hmm. And I think that it's... I've often said that a lot of this job is social work because you mm -hmm. really have to be mm -hmm. very sensitive to the dynamics of the whole family mm -hmm. and what might be happening. And the other thing sometimes is what happened during the week that you didn't touch mm -hmm. this? Because if for some reason their food stamps were cut off mm -hmm. and they're worried about feeding their family, they are going to give a lick about stacking, stacking blocks <laughs> if they're worried about where's my baby's milk going to come from. Mm -hmm. And we have to be sensitive to that and have a kind of some ideas of where they mm -hmm. might be able to contact agencies in our back pocket because these things like the heat is cut off the water is cut off mm -hmm. and we have to we are the ones that know this we can't walk away from that knowledge we mm -hmm. have to help I wonder if um, even more effective than asking the parent how a particular activity uh, was going with them if you were to engage that activity um, and have the parent do that activity or 
um, if you were to initiate that activity with the particular child and be able to make observations, um, I'm wondering if that might be a more comfortable manner, then you don't have to engage in the parents, um, perhaps who may be feeling a little embarrassed um, because of maybe a life situation that occurred and they don't have to come out and say to you, well, we didn't get to that activity or um, to make them feel uncomfortable by having to uh, shy away from you or passively answer the question um, by ignoring you. So I wonder if that might be a more effective way of being able to determine if parents have been utilizing the strategies which we have provided them with. And I think that the sensitivity factor is certainly something that needs to be put into play. I taught in uh, Saginaw in a charter school um, in Buena Vista Township. And it was very difficult as these children had many different struggles than what I would uh, consider <laughs> that I certainly had. Um, one of my students actually was involved in a drive-by shooting. Um, so my students, where we were practicing drills, would actually have to do the drills. Um, sometimes at night, they would be sleeping in a different bed. Um, I had a young lady who walked in the snow without boots one time to come to school. And these were all factors that I had to take into consideration when interacting with the child or interacting with the family. How easy it would have been for me to yell at the child, why are you late for school or to post judgment? But I didn't. Instead, I took the time to get to know the family. And by the end of the school year, I remember the parent brought a statue to me and it was a statue of an angel. And she shared with me it was because she felt that I was their angel. And that was an amazing experience for me personally. And I feel it's because of my sensitivity to their needs and being able to listen to them and take certain things into consideration were certainly huge factors in all that. So we have to always consider the human factor, the life factor, um, as well as taking in consideration the culture. Sometimes uh, there are some things that are just culturally different for individuals. Uh, they're diverse individuals. They may do things differently, um, which goes to prove why it's important that we involve the parents and ask them what they feel would be great strategies and ideas that they have for their child. Mm -hmm. That leads to one of my next questions, which is what resources do you most commonly recommend to parents who are in need of assistance and how do you decide which recommendation to make? It's really individual mm -hmm. um, based on the family's needs where we would refer. We, I mean, a big part of our job um, through the, uh, our early on, we have early on coordination meetings, mm -hmm. service coordinators every month. Um, is and not, who would participate in, in that? Any early on um, coordinator in, in our in Saginaw County, home okay. either home visitor, either special ed or now um, regular ed, okay. maybe Part C early okay. on. Mm -hmm. um, and a big focus is just knowing and becoming aware of all the, mm -hmm. the different agencies mm -hmm. and resources out in the community, like how do you access WIC, you know, mm -hmm. contacts to DHS, contacts to the health, health department, um, mental health, mm -hmm. um, all of those things, uh, down to uh, housing, you mm -hmm. know, the landlord association, mm -hmm. um, how do you get in touch with someone at Consumers Energy. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes you can't just you know, if you have a new home visitor, say, okay, here's a list of people that you know. It's kind of like on-the-job training, you know. I mean, if you're in a situation and you find yourself with a family that, you know, didn't have any water or, or had been living in their house for a month or six weeks without any water, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that just happened, happened recently. Um, you know, how do you, who do you connect with? And then you kind of have to 
do some detective work mm -hmm. and figure out how to solve this problem. But we're constantly sharing that with each other. And we're so lucky in Saginaw Public Schools that we have, you know, we're based in the same place and we can bounce that off each other. We've always had that, mm -hmm. whereas people out in the out county are doing the same thing, mm -hmm. but they're just covering a, a wider so area and they kind of they feel like they're you know, out there. So coming together once a month um, for these meetings is helpful mm -hmm. to, to be able to know where to refer and who to refer to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm gonna flip the coin. I, I asked you to talk about a success could you also describe one home visit that maybe didn't go as well as you had hoped mm -hmm. and what you learned from that experience? Well, I would love to share this lovely story about my OT friend and I coming to the door and we're knocking on the door and you can hear this scrambling inside. And they opened the door and the marijuana smoke came rolling out the door. Mm. Now, the problem was is that they had gotten rid of it all. So it's only my opinion that that's what that smoke was. Mm, so if I had called DHS, which I have in the past with suspicions and I hadn't been very successful and really alienated the family, but because I didn't know for sure, I just said, I'm not going to come in right now. The mom called me later in the day and she said, I just want to say thank you. And I said, thank you. And she said, you know, you know. And I said, well, okay, so can I come over now and we can talk about this? Because let's talk about what's best for your baby. Mm -hmm. And she, because I didn't yell at her at that moment with my suspicions, um, and uh, she then realized that maybe she could trust me, and I was able to really go a long way got her into a substance abuse situation, a program, mm -hmm. and, and it really turned out to work well. Mm -hmm. Now, if I had known for sure, I'm a mandated reporter, mm -hmm. and I have to say that right here in front of the world. I'm a mandated reporter, mm -hmm. and I have reported mm -hmm. in the past, mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so that has to happen. Mm -hmm. But it was just my suspicion that it was marijuana, mm -hmm. and, uh, but there was incense everywhere, so it could have been <laughs> incense instead. A few questions I have about the situation that Sally was speaking of. Um, through my education and training, um, it is my understanding that it is not my job as a mandated reporter to actually know um, the facts or to know for certain. It is just simply my job if I have a suspicion or if I suspect something, that as a mandated reporter, it is my job to report it. And then after I report it, another individual comes in and will investigate the situation to either say that my suspicion was accurate and correct, or to say that it's not, um, or sometimes they send you a message that says there's already a case open concerning this. Um, so I wondered if I was in the same situation that um, Sally was in, if I might not have contacted um, CPS with the suspicion and then they go in to confirm that suspicion. Um, if you could clarify that for me, that would be amazing. Um, the second question that I have now, as silly as this may seem, Marijuana is now a legal substance. So if I were to go into a home and I were to actually smell marijuana, would that still be something which I would have to report? Um, I would assume that if I saw it out, that clearly I would have to report that as that would be providing the infant or toddler with uh, easy access to uh, a drug. But I wonder if I were to smell it, if that is something which I would have to still report since it is legal now. Mm -hmm. I was um, in an instance where the family had um, was already receiving early on services through the early on nurse. And, but it was time to pull me in, a teacher. And um, the mother was beautiful at the first visit. The nurse even came and she got caught up with um, her time with the parent as well. But then after that, 
I was not let back into the house. I would go, and even on times when she said she would be there, but you mm -hmm. go and you could tell that you, someone's in the home, but nobody's answering the door. Okay. And um, she just eventually came to tell me over the phone that um, no, she didn't think she needed our services because her little girl was doing much better, which she mm -hmm. had progress from the time the nurse had seen her from the first visit to the next. And um, mom felt like what her daughter needed, she was able to provide and she mm -hmm. didn't need any extra help. Mm -hmm. And so there's times like that when, mm -hmm. you know, parents just deem our services not something that Mm -hmm. is needed at the time mm -hmm. and so reluctantly you know you mm -hmm. have to say okay I understand and mm -hmm. um, I'm here whenever you mm -hmm. you know want my services you're free mm -hmm. to give me a call and and that kind of thing but there is there must be a lot of um, times where you see defensiveness on the part of the parent mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. and many of the questions that our students wanted to pose were uh, related to that such as how do you start that conversation if it's if you're referred to the family, but it wasn't the parent that, that chose that, or how do you um, uh, share news with parents when their child isn't progressing as you had anticipated? You know, those difficult conversations, how do you best s start well, that? I, I mean, as far as um, calling a parent, um, and they might not have referred, I mean, it is still the parent's decision even to talk to us. So mm -hmm. we might get a referral, whenever I get a referral from someone else that isn't, the, I always say, even with the doctors is, is the parent aware of this mm -hmm. referral? And then when I call the parent, um, I just have a conversation of helping them buy into, you know, I just got this referral, I just, but first I'm really, you know, I, wa I wanna know your concerns, if you have any concerns, mm -hmm. you know, this is what the doctor said, but what are your concerns? Mm -hmm. And again, putting that parent kind of in the driver's seat to be the one to okay. voice any concerns. If they say, I don't, you know, the doctor really, he said this or that, but I don't really have any concerns at all. I think, I think she's absolutely fine. And I said, well, you know, you, you do know her best and you're there every day and just mm -hmm. kind of, kind of taking it, you know, going around the back door and saying, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, I, that's, and you probably, you know, in the doctor's office, it's only, you're in there for five minutes and children are afraid of the doctor sometimes. So sometimes going over to their side with the parent mm -hmm. will make them open up a little bit I see. and, you know, mm -hmm. and, and be um, more mm -hmm. uh, willing to at least let you talk about it or mm -hmm. let you come for a visit. Mm -hmm. um, and then sharing any mm -hmm. news or no progress. Mm -hmm. That's hard. That's hard. Um, although since we're there every week, right. it's usually n it's not like a big surprise where the right. teacher comes after six weeks to a report mm -hmm. card mm -hmm. and you didn't know that your kid wasn't in class. You know, <laughs> I mean you're there every week. <laughs> you're there every week, but it's still on paper. If we show anything like if a child's 24 months and they're uh -huh. at the eight to 10 month level in gross motor skills or whatever. That's you know that visual reminder is still yes. pretty. Mm -hmm. right. Yes, pretty and it's it's just being it's just being there. And like Janet said, you don't say that right away. Mm -hmm. I mean, we hopefully when you have to convey really some bad news, you have a relationship with the family. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you have a relationship with the family, you both kind of grieve. I mean, mm -hmm. I I want the children that I've seen and to to be successful. And when I see that they're not, or I remember I had a little girl that. Um, she looked like that she just had a speech and language issue, and then all of a sudden she started regressing. I mean, severe regression, mm -hmm. where we ended up going to Detroit and looking to see if this was, you know, Rett syndrome or what was going mm -hmm. on, because her skills just really went backwards. And I mean, I grieved with that mom, mm -hmm. and it was it was really horrible. And and I think just the parents knowing that you care and that that it's hard on you too. I mm -hmm. think. Not that it helps, but I, I think that then you, you go through it, the process together. I love the reemphasis on the relationship and the trust that you've built with the parent. As no parent wants to hear something that could be interpreted as negative from someone that they do not respect or someone that they don't trust or even like. So that relationship is has proven once again to be the most crucial step and the first step that a home visitor should take. I also think it's important to take into consideration the manner in which the news may be delivered to a parent. It's important to keep it as positive as possible. 
there are numerous things to celebrate. The child has made great progress and growth in something. I learned from some recent training that with children um, to do what's called the four to one approach, four positives for one, not necessarily negative, but one area in which you can improve. Um, I love the verbiage that they use with that. And I can see where this may be a good situation in which to be able to use um, what I've learned as well, mentioning to the parents perhaps four positive things to one area in which the child needs to improve. Not necessarily saying something that the child did bad or poorly, but something that you want that child to feel the most success in. Uh, taking a look at the goals and revisiting those goals and, and adjusting it in a manner where the child can feel successful, where the parents have something to celebrate. And that's not to say that the child won't obtain that goal, just maybe in smaller steps or changing and tweaking something. But definitely build that relationship with the parent because that is going to be key to communicating with them anything that you have to say. Mm -hmm. Su You're That's your role yeah. to, to support, support. them. Mm -hmm. you know, not, not to always just deliver bad news. And we make a real effort, um, at least our, our team always does, that um, when we go in right away and we're seeing some hinky things maybe with development that wasn't written up in the referral, <laughs> um, that were not... Hinky things. Hinky. <laughs> <laughs> things out of the ordinary. <laughs> um, you know, the child, the doctor's concerned because the child doesn't say 20 words, but yet when we go to the house, he, the child is spinning in circles <laughs> and, and flapping and, you know, gnawing on the electrical cords. Okay. <laughs> they didn't write that in the referral. <laughs> and um, so instead of saying, you know, a lot of times parents will say, well, what do you think? And, and it's your instinct to say, oh, Geez, well, I don't know, but I know it's not just speech. Um, or, you know, I think it might be autism. We never say that. Mm -hmm. We never mm -hmm. utter a diagnosis that we think, even though we think we probably are right, and that's what it ends up to be. We just always say, well, you know, there's a lot of things we're going to have to look into. And parents might say, well, I think, you know, mm -hmm. my third cousin removed has a child with autism, yes, so that's yes. what I think. And, and um now, well, that's one of the things we can look at, but you know we can't mm -hmm. say that right now. We mm -hmm. have to, we have to do the evaluation. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One, one of the things I think is absolutely key for a parent advisor to be able to do is to know how to ask questions. Right. And and it's not the what questions. It's how do you open probe, open, use open-ended questioning because it would be, well, it seems like your concerns, or I noticed mm -hmm. that you um, seem to be worried about this then to let them, it's not about, about us doing the talking, it's about them doing the talking. And you know that you've been successful if you have a conversation with a family and they're doing at least 85 to 90% of the talking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's really that parent advisor skill at being able to question a family and probe in a very positive way to, to get information that's not mm -hmm. threatening and, and, and mm -hmm. more conversational. Because just mm -hmm. like Janet said, in that first conversation, it's not like, well, okay, I'm Janet Topham, I'm with Project Fine, this is what we can do for you, A, B, C, D, E. It's right. like, tell me about your child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Share with me some of your concerns, right. and mm -hmm. then get them talking, and then you can, mm -hmm. you can get to the all, oh, this is what we have to offer later. Mm -hmm. right. Being able to have the parents do 85 to 90% of the talking is an area in which I know I would need to work on and improve on, I understand the importance of listening as it can be extremely therapeutic. It's a great way to get to know families and to build relationships with people. But I get so passionate and so excited about what it is that I have to offer that sometimes I can find myself doing a lot of talking. And so that is something that I know that I would have to improve on. I'm also very thrilled to hear that it would not be my job to go in and let them know, here are the services that are available, A, B, C, D, E. As I know that that is an area, again, in which I would need to improve. Familiarizing myself with the services that are available 
for specific children or families, as every child and family are going to need different services. And so I was very nervous about having to know and be familiar with every service, every program that would be available in the county, especially if working for a county in which I don't live. Um, and so it's reassuring to know that that's something that comes with time and that it's something that I could simply research um, and look. And that's where working with a team is going to prove to be very valuable. Um, through the collaboration, it would be wonderful to be able to utilize the different individuals on the team and ask them the resources so that way I can get to know what they are um, and then be able to provide those resources to the parents, um, perhaps a little at a time as I learn and as they ask and as they need. Right, mm -hmm. but, that, exactly. but, but a lot of, in programs, people that work with families and do home intervention, they feel a lot of times that it's their responsibility to go and say what services we can provide and this is what we have to offer and this is what will be helpful. Mm -hmm. And that they're not ready for it. They're still they're not even they're listening. listening. No, yeah. I mean, they're not parents, listening. if they're really concerned about their child, they're not really listening to what the mm -hmm. services right. are. And they right. have a stranger in their home. Yeah. Yeah. And that stranger being in their home is not a good thing in mm -hmm. the sense that this is not regular. Mm -hmm. Right. This is and not a lot normal. of times it's just life issues that are important mm -hmm. at that moment in time. I remember just going by a home and um, getting to know the family so I could do the parent interview. And mm -hmm. it was all about, well, um, I'm looking for a place. I got to move. And mm -hmm. so it's like, this is what she wants to talk about. Mm -hmm. You know, have I seen any places available? Mm -hmm. You know, what <laughs> services are out there to help her find mm -hmm. a place? Mm -hmm. You know, and then it becomes, you know, okay, I'll ask around and I'll keep my eyes open for what I see as I'm driving. Mm -hmm. You know, they that's the issue for the moment in mm -hmm. time. So sometimes you have to just roll back and listen to the parent and go with their conversation. And you you mentioned life issues and how uh -huh. and that tends to lead the discussion that you have with your families. Mm -hmm. And, you know, parents who have children in this age group are probably dealing with some some pretty big things, mm -hmm. a lot of expectations that they have themselves as well as grandma, neighbor mm -hmm. down the street, third mm -hmm. cousin once removed, mm -hmm. as you mentioned. You know, uh, our students are wondering, what kind of advice do you give to parents around issues like discipline? What are some mm -hmm. techniques, some types of things that you recommend to these parents during this time? I have a really good um, home visit story about that. Um, a family, a little boy that had autism, and all the, the mother, sisters, and the grandmother all felt that she just wasn't spanking him enough or making him sit enough or you know and um, mother understood his autism and understood what she needed to do using visual schedules and things like that but the family the extended family just thought he wasn't minding mm -hmm. and so I mm -hmm. did a night home visit and I brought some videos on autism and um, it was so neat when I got to the house, the mother, she had the spread out there, you know, and the sisters were there and the grandma was there and we looked at the video and we had conversation and it was so important to have, mm -hmm. be able to be there to support the mother about the child. They, they had a better understanding. They, they just were doing what they thought mm -hmm. was right because he wasn't minding or mm -hmm. they felt that he wasn't minding. And so it wasn't they were doing it out of meanness. It was they were doing it because they thought that that was best. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And once they realized that the disability was interfering with this child's behavior and strategies to support the mom and to support the child to having positive behavior, you know, it was a lot better. But, you know, that was a role that I could help that family mm -hmm. um, in explaining it to the siblings mm -hmm. and the, the grandmas. So. Mm -hmm. I think the first thing that we need to always take into consideration when looking at particular behaviors is we need to look at the function of the behavior. What is the motivation behind that behavior? Um, and sometimes we just have to make our best guess. And that's where working with the parents is going to prove, once again, to be most, most important. As that parent knows the child, um, they may be able to tell you that the child displays that behavior during certain times of the day. Um, if not, perhaps we can track it to determine that. Uh, sometimes the parents will be able to tell you what some of the triggers are that cause that behavior to occur. 
but I think it's important to take into consideration that behaviors do not just occur. There's always a reason behind it. And before we can try to um, fix, I don't want to say fix, but um, before we can try to help and support that child in that behavior, we need to know and understand the why behind it. So always try to figure out the why before the how. I think the other thing that we need to take into consideration is that discipline does not mean punishing a child. Discipline means teaching. And that is our responsibility as the parent advocate and the advisor is to go in and teach, teach. And that means discipline. And discipline oftentimes has a negative connotation behind it. And it doesn't have to, just like consequences. Someone may ask about what consequences do you provide for children? There are positive consequences as well as negative consequences. And so I think sometimes we need to take into consideration the verbiage that we're using and what it actually means when looking at that word. Um, if trying to work with parents, we're able to determine the function of behavior, why the behavior has occurred, and we need to work with certain disciplines, we need to once again take the time to get to know the parent so that way we know and understand what it is that they're, they're thinking and what they have done in the past. Um, we need to also take into consideration their culture as different cultures may have different ways in which they find to be acceptable. I know I can say from a personal experience, I have a nephew who suffers from ADHD. He's severely um, ADHD. He also has a fairly high ACE score um, as he's experienced some trauma in his life as an infant and toddler. And there have been times that I have tried to work with my own mother and circumstances. And she comes from a time when you tell a child to do something and they mind and they do it. And that was the culture in which she was brought up. And so sometimes when providing those different strategies on discipline, it can be rather difficult um, as that's not what she's accustomed to. And so I need to make sure that I'm getting her to understand the why behind it, getting her to buy into it. Um, and it's much easier because it is my mother. Um, and I'm not saying that there's anything that she's doing wrong. I'm not saying that um, she's bad. I'm simply taking into consideration her culture and the manner in which she knows um, before I can present some different ideas on how to deal with situations. And it's also important to know that that's not a blanket statement to say, what kind of discipline do you provide? It depends on the circumstance. It depends on the situation. It depends on the environment. Um, it depends on the culture. It depends on um, your relationship with the parent. It, there's just so many things to take into consideration that it's difficult to answer this question with just one statement. And also we can um, model, um, maybe if they're having a temper tantrum, mm -hmm. you know, uh, do you pay attention to the tantrum and, and, and uh, encourage it to go along or do you ignore the temper tantrum and maybe mm -hmm. it'll go away or time out is certainly something that, that we have on occasion Mm -hmm. Talk to them about that, and mm -hmm. and that's one advantage of being right. in the home, right? Home services because mm -hmm. if a child is having some behavior issues like tantruming and out of control tantruming, you know, tantruming, it's much easier to to help the parent walk through those steps in their home environment than mm -hmm. it is in the middle of a center with a bunch of other parents, mm -hmm. um, and they feel much more well. It's much more individual, but I think. You know, I mean, imagine yourself having to do that out in public. It's, mm -hmm. it's just better mm -hmm. to be able to do it in mm -hmm. the home. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. Yeah, the modeling works nice because I can recall just a couple of weeks ago, a parent um, watching us work with her child and um, the therapist would give deep pressure 
mm. for him mm. when he was tantruming. And, she, and so she gave him to the mother and said, here, you try it, just give him a hug. And she gave him a nice, soft, cuddly hug. And the therapist says, no, apply a little more deep pressure. And she did, and it was amazing how he calmed down. And she was like, oh, is that what I need to do? You know, so the light bulb came on, and you know, she appreciated that. And then another instance, he tantrumed, he threw himself back mm -hmm. and you know wanted to do things his way and not our way and mm -hmm. so we chose to ignore him we pulled off and pulled the toy back and said mm -hmm. okay well when you stop this and when you're ready then we can resume our play mm -hmm. and he responded to that and mm -hmm. so mom again says oh just ignore him huh? and it's like <laughs> we had been trying Talking to tell that. her mm -hmm. that but you until should. she was actually to see it and see it working that mm -hmm. she decided that, mm -hmm. oh, that works, I'm mm -hmm. going to try that. And with the, the deep pressure, actually yeah. feeling the degree to which that had but to be done, done. in order yes. for it to be successful, too. Right, really yes. fit for her. Well, since we're imagining, one other thing I'd like us to imagine is to imagine that you were sitting on an interview committee. What characteristic are you looking for in an infant toddler service provider? What would make you say, ah, this person may be successful in this position? This is a wonderful question um, as it's something that I have uh, considered doing. And so I was very appreciative of being able to hear the different suggestions and ideas that came from the home visitor panels um, about what kinds of characteristics that they were looking for in a potential candidate um, and that they might be looking for responses from somebody that would be interviewing for this job. Some of the things that I feel that I have learned home visitor should possess is they should definitely possess um, compassion, sensitivity. So you're going to come across numerous individuals in different walks of life going through different situations and we need to take that into consideration. We're going to hear a lot of things um, and be exposed to a lot of things. As Deb mentioned, the parents may share some information with us, some of their most intimate secrets. And so I think confidentiality and the ability to be able to respect confidentiality is definitely something that would be important for a home visitor. Knowledgeable. Um, and although that's an area in which I can admit that I need to um, work on specifically, I think that being knowledgeable in how to obtain information is definitely what I feel is going to be important. Not necessarily knowledgeable in everything that's available and having all the answers, but knowledgeable in how to obtain those answers, knowledgeable in how to research, um, utilize resources available, whether it be the internet, um, the community, or the team. Because team collaboration is so important, uh, being able to work as a team member would be very important. Um, being open to new ideas and suggestions while contributing your own ideas, uh, being comfortable in doing so is certainly another characteristic that I feel a home visitor should have. Being personable, very important as building those relationships is going to be key and crucial which is something that the panel has mentioned over and over again and something that I have emphasized over and over again. Um, I feel those are all some great characteristics of a home visitor and things that I feel that I possess as well as admitting some of the areas in which I know that a home visitor should have and that I can improve on as well. Well, actually, I was in an interview situation um, this summer, um, interviewing for a, one of our early intervention teachers. And the qualities that I was looking for, even though we had to follow this form for interviewing that had really nothing to do with um, home visiting, <laughs> um, I think the biggest, um, the biggest quality is, is compassion. Um, 
and also knowledge of general development, at least having some background in knowing what is normal or, or yeah, typical. Typical, thing. typical, right? <laughs> typical development in, in a child from zero to three. Um, compassion, eagerness to connect with people and being able to engage people. Mm -hmm. um, you don't necessarily have to feel like in an interview situation, um, you know, like you are very smooth and I'd rather have someone a little, um, how can I say this, more um, conversational, and maybe asking questions mm -hmm. of us mm -hmm. so that you kind of get an idea of it, can that person uh, feel comfortable asking questions to complete strangers. <laughs> <laughs> As something that I hear you saying then is that it's important to have somebody who is willing to learn, um, ask questions, and willing to obtain those answers and be open-minded. Um, personal questions. <laughs> um, and it's, it's just kind of a feeling because I, a, lot of, a lot of what we do can be taught, you know, learning the typical development and, and some questioning techniques and things like that. But I think you have to have a, just kind of something that's in that person, a desire to help other people and a, and a desire to um, connect with people, mm -hmm. but yet wanting to empower them mm -hmm. too and not just be not just carry them, mm -hmm. you know, exactly. not just try to save them. Mm -hmm. So that's a really long answer. <laughs> long answer, yes. Appreciated, definitely. Great information for sure. Um, I know that I certainly agree with you in saying that you have to be a person who would be willing to help other individuals. I read the book one time, The Five Love Languages, and something that I learned about myself is that my love language is act of service. If I want to show somebody that I love them, I will do something for them and help them. Um, that's also the manner in which I appreciate having people show me love is by doing something for me. And I think that knowing that about myself and knowing that my love language act of service is something that would make me a good home visitor and effective. <laughs> I think you need to be flexible. Flexible. Is mm -hmm. absolutely essential because this is out of your realm. You need to be creative mm -hmm. because you're going to leave your toy bag at the office because you're going to think about what kinds of things can you use in the home to support that child's development and learning. And I think you have to be non-judgmental non because where you come from may be totally different than where the families that you're working with come from. So Flexibility is definitely something that I feel home visitors should possess and something that I have found in the education system that it's something that you just need to possess overall as a teacher and educator, I think. Um, it's something that uh, being a person of a uh, type A personality, it's something that I have certainly had to learn and become accustomed to. Creativity, I love that you threw that in there. So many times, um, things like the arts are not considered, and that's where the right-brained individual is going to have the opportunity to be able to blossom and shine and be very appreciative of utilizing their skills in this. Um, it's something that I embrace, which is why I do such things as videos and assignments like this to show and have the opportunity to be able to display my creativity. And um, I definitely agree with you in all of those aspects. Non-judgmental is going to be a big piece. Um, you're going to drive up to homes that look different and homes, you're going to walk into homes that may not be as clean as you might prefer or um, hear stories about things that have happened that perhaps you may not um, consider to be um, right or um, what you would do. And we need to have the opportunity to be able to listen to these parents and see the manner in which they live, 
without judging them, but instead taking that information to be able to help and support them and their child. So, you know, and, and, and really not afraid of being getting dirty. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, I love that she threw that in there. The idea of not afraid to get dirty. Um, one of my favorite activities to do in the classroom is to paint. And a fun little fact, I am the only teacher in my building who is willing and loves to use glitter. <laughs> and, but that's being flexible yeah. and, mm -hmm. and being aware of other cultural differences. Yes. Mm -hmm. And yeah. not just cultural, but socioeconomic, yes. probably more than cultural in a way. Right. Um, and, yeah. and remember, they love their children. Just like That's I right. love they're, my they're children and grandchildren. I mean, yes, they love definitely. their children and they want what's best for them. Mm -hmm. They're letting this stranger in right. mm -hmm. because they love their child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something that I've also learned through my leadership training is that the first thing that you should always do is you should always, always consider positive intent. And I feel that that speaks to this situation as much as any other situation. These parents want their children to be amazing individuals. They want the best for their child. They love them so much. And regardless of whether we agree with them, whether it be how they live their lives, how they speak, how they do things, we need to always, always know positive intent. Their intentions are just as positive as mine. And that's mm -hmm. really the most important thing is to see that, to mm -hmm. appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing how, because we are there for their children, how much they tend to grow mm -hmm. on us mm -hmm. and thus on them. And it's just wonderful to see that, you know, oh, Miss D, are you all right? Are you okay? You know, mm -hmm. oh, I'm fine. You know, if, you know, whatever. It's and it's like it is a great yeah, relationship. Just, yes. It really is it's a very all unique about, relationship. It mm -hmm. is. It really is truly unique. And, and there it is again, the word relationships. Why does it come up so many times in this? Why does everything come back to relationships? Because it is the single most important thing that home visitors need to take into consideration. It is the single most important thing that any person in any job should do and take into consideration. I don't care if you work for huge corporations or if you are a teacher, relationships are the key to every, every job and position because they are just the most important thing. And if you haven't heard it enough, let me say it one more time. Build relationships with those with whom you work. You know, they're excited to have you come into their home and accept their home for who they are and how mm -hmm. it is and how they are. And you're just happy to be there with them. I mean, mm -hmm. they can tell, you know, genuine Mm -hmm. concern and, mm -hmm. and love. Mm -hmm. so I, I had a family that I worked with years ago and um, she was very, she was limited intellectually. She'd been in special education, education herself and she had a little boy. Um, and uh, so she was, she was on SSI and that was before the era of cell phones. Mm -hmm. And she rarely had a phone and she moved approximately every three months. <laughs> and so she had my home phone. Um, she, she didn't usually carry through with a lot of our challenges and, and as far as, and she could, she could read as far as you know, actually doing things. But by golly, she called me whenever she moved. She would call me on a Sunday night, because I always saw her Monday morning, or Monday afternoon. Hi, Janet. Um, well, we moved over the weekend. I might have just been there last Monday and I didn't know they were moving, but she always called. And so, and she never missed a home visit. And she may not have been um, as far as actually 
teaching her child and able to do that, but the connection that she had with with me, mm -hmm. um, and thinking I was a wonderful teacher when mm -hmm. really, <laughs> I kind of felt a lot of times like I wasn't doing a whole lot, but she was always there. And mm -hmm. she, so in her own way, even though she wasn't following a lesson plan, um, she was following her lesson plan, mm -hmm. and she was very dependable about being there. And what better compliment for an educator to receive? Mm -hmm. Which will then carry on later when she goes to school. Yes, mm -hmm. and, and actually it, it, it did, it did. So. You mentioned no, a number of characteristics to that would be necessary. Flexibility, uh, compa being compassionate, being non-judgmental, but also you mentioned creativity. Mm -hmm. And I know in, in deference to you and, and your position on, on toy bags and the need for using uh, natural materials in the home, could we just conclude our, our conversation today, maybe if each of you would give an example of a, of an item that you might find in a home and how you would use it with a family? Well, I guess the, the whole stacking thing, um, there's a lot of things to stack in a home. I've stacked cans before, like smaller cans. Also, um, CD or DVD cases. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people seem to have a lot of DVDs. <laughs> and those, those can be, those can be a, a stacking exercise. Um, different things when a child is little, you know, like 12 months, any kind of bowl or pan, um, putting objects. I've brought little blocks, or maybe the family has little blocks, or any sort of small objects like measuring cups, just when they're at that stage where they mm -hmm. are putting things in the container and taking them out, you know, anything that you have in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. um, those mm -hmm. things are pretty so like available. Mm -hmm. What you do? Oh, I have a little guy that's two. <clears throat> And he's a big on the cars and all that. He even has one of the, the mobile the, that operate by a battery, the mm -hmm. big one. And it's usually sitting right there in the dining room. And he takes it and he goes backwards and forwards and he bumps the, the cabinet behind him and the table in front of him, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, um, he also has all kinds of other little cars, the little race box cars and that. And he's usually, you know, got a car or two here and he always wants to, you know, keep them with him as we're playing and engaged. And so I take that his cars as an opportunity to teach him how, yes, the cars go forward and, you know, for them to come back to me, you don't just push it back to me. I trained him how to turn the vehicle around back to the front. See, mm -hmm. here's the front where the lights are, and this is the seat where the guy sits. See, the door opens, this mm -hmm. is the front, and we turn it around and mm -hmm. we push it back. And so, you know, we I had an opportunity to teach him mm -hmm. how to turn the vehicle around to go forward. And mm -hmm. that language, too. The language, mm -hmm. too, that was involved. With that. So it was something awesome. that's already at his house. Yeah, already mm -hmm. at his house, because okay. he's all about the vehicles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So. Um, you can take cereal boxes, and if you, you have family save cereal boxes, and if they get the same box of cereal each time, you take one of the boxes and you just cut it out, and then the child can have like a puzzle that they can put on top of the other cereal box. So instead of bringing some fancy puzzle, well, you, Doug. You, can, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you can use what you have in the home. You know, you can use a muffin tin pan to one-to-one -one correspondence by putting mm -hmm. little cars in each muffin holder. You know, mm -hmm. pots and pans matching. Um, socks, laundry. Laundry has so many wonderful opportunities. Um, you know, I'm glad you imagine. think so. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, and, but that, the thing is, when you think about in the home, you think about child-initiated activities. You think about mm -hmm. parent tasks. Parents have to cook. Parents have to clean. Parents write bills. Whatever. Mm -hmm. So, how can those activities be incorporated for that child? You know, um, you know. So, I, I think if you think of like different, you know, parent tasks, child-initiated, child care. Mm -hmm. Changing pants. Mm -hmm. How can that, you know, the language, you know, oh, this is a smelly diaper, oh, you know, or it's wet or um, whatever. But, mm -hmm. you know, thinking about activities that have to be done in the day and how can you incorporate skills that that child developmentally should have, you know, that's by you every know. day. I think using everyday materials and embedding the activities um, to help teach the parent and teach the child the skills that they need to reach the goals that we've set for them are two lessons which I very much appreciated learning and that I learned a lot about um, in this course. Um, in my mind, 
people would drop their child off to a center and I would have this amazing facility with with blocks and puzzles and toys and all these great things when in all reality it's using everyday materials that are available and accessible to the parents. Um, probably my very favorite material to use is a plastic bowl. Um, it doesn't matter what it is and you can use it to put objects inside of to reach and grasp. Um, you can you put the object out of reach. I had one with a little lip around it to be able to grab and scooch um, and make different explorations with. If it falls over and tips over, it can roll, um, which is another great opportunity for exploration for children. Um, putting objects inside of it, rice inside of it, noodles inside of it, wonderful sensory activities, water inside of it. Um, don't be afraid to get messy. <laughs> the possibilities are just endless of materials that you can find around your home to be able to use. Um, cushions are great tools to use. Um, and I think of different foods um, that come in different containers. You can utilize any of those boxes for different activities, an oatmeal box or a cereal box. Um, all wonderful tools to be able to utilize to teach people lessons to be able to use with their child. And that's where the creativity piece will come in. And I absolutely love that. Embedding the activities in are wonderful. Parents are busy. They're working two jobs. Um, some of them are working one job. As a teacher, I come home, I'm tired, I'm exhausted. How wonderful to know that I can teach my child while cooking my dinner um, instead of having to entertain the child or um, come up with some great impressive lesson to do with them. I can just do it with an everyday activity. It's just amazing and probably my favorite lessons of all. Everyday things. You don't need special things. Because bringing in special things, too, tells a, makes the parent think, well, you have this, and so therefore you can do it, and so you're the one skilled at it, and I'm not so skilled. When we want to say, no, what you have in the home, we're not adding more tasks on your already full day. What we're trying to do is embed, do embedded interventions mm -hmm. into what they're already doing and using those things in the, the home. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Well, a few things come to mind. Uh, toilet paper or a paper towel tube um, mm -hmm. is, is just magical. I mean, for so many reasons, you can do voluntary release by dropping that little car into uh -huh. the, um, and um, there's the I spy, and, and we can look at all these language things that we can see through mm -hmm. looking at that. Um, a Kleenex box is one of my favorites because it's like an object constancy. You, you, it's still there even though you can't see it anymore. Mm -hmm. But where did it go? Where, mm -hmm. where is it? Mm -hmm. And then they have to reach in, and that's a very interesting tactile thing for them to have to reach into this little hole mm -hmm. and pull it back out. And um, so I've had a lot of fun with um, many, Napkins, just um, having a toy there and then just covering it up for mm -hmm. a little baby baby. Sometimes in the beginning, it's gone. It's mm -hmm. out of sight, out of mind. But mm -hmm. as they get older, and you you know, then you teach them to pull it off or pull the diaper off or the towel off. It's lovely because mm -hmm. you know because then the parents can see. Oh, mm -hmm. you know, I can do that with their cereal bowl, and I can do that with uh, mm -hmm. so many different things. So yeah, mm -hmm. and you're lots. also pointing out some success of the, for their child and helping mm -hmm. with that mm -hmm. attachment mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, ladies, for your time and, and oh, your, welcome. your expertise here. We appreciate it's it. It's very fun. Thank you. Any last words, Deb Debbie? No, just that I just think that we have to always value those relationships that we have with families and keep them close to our heart and make sure that they're in their confidential. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. right. yes. that's so important. And mm -hmm. that, that really we... It's a privilege and an honor to go into someone's home and to work right. with a family. Mm -hmm. It really mm -hmm. is. Yeah, you so. have to remember that. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you would have asked me before this course what a home visitor was, I would have told you 
that it's just a teacher, like a preschool teacher, who goes to a home and checks out the person's home and the lifestyle of a child and just tests them to see where they are academically before they come to school. That's what I thought a home visitor was. To be completely honest with you, I wasn't even aware that it was an occupation that one could hold. I definitely wasn't aware that you work with infants and toddlers ages zero to three. I didn't know that it was connected to the early on services or to special education. As you can tell, I've certainly learned a lot through my experience. It's interesting because if you look at my first post, I mentioned that I was not very excited about this course as I'm a kindergarten teacher and I felt I was most interested in learning about kindergarten. But something that I've learned through this course is that the reason that I love and appreciate early childhood is because I wanna make a difference. And I recognize and understand the importance of that difference occurring early on, the interventions occurring as soon as we possibly can make it happen. And I thought that I wanted to take this course because it was required of my, for my program and that I wanted to be an early childhood educator because teachers make a difference. But after listening to this panel and the discussion that's occurring, I have learned that home visitors truly are the individuals who are making a difference. They're making a difference in the home and they're making a difference for a child. They're making a difference for an entire family. And they're doing it at a really young age where it's really going to make a difference for that child later in life as they grow and and learn and, and go to school and, and become the most amazing people that they can possibly be. And so I'm thankful for this course, for the many lessons and things that I've learned, for its constant reminders of just how important relationships truly are, for the emphasis of early interventions, for recognizing the importance of working with an entire family and the team, a team effort is what helps children and individuals the best. I'm appreciative for the emphasis on everyday activities. As so many times as a teacher, I will talk to parents and, and come up with these activities that they can do at home to help their child that can take five minutes. I, I don't know how many times I've, I've mentioned cooking. It's just a great activity to do with the child that they're already doing at home. And so... I've learned not only about being a home visitor and about infants and toddlers, but I've learned a lot about education in general and working with young children. And I feel these are valuable lessons that any educator can use, regardless of the age and regardless of the, the situation that they are in. And it just is why I choose to continue to learn and continue to take professional developments and to go to college is for courses 
and lessons like this.